Welcome to ninth episode of Curiosity, the weekly science program. So as usual, I'm going to share you what I learned, uh, you know, in the last week, that is the week number 29th of 2020. So this week's episode features stories across the disciplines as usual. So this episode, we are going to cover Oxford vaccine for the COVID-19, outdoor teaching for COVID-19 prevention in school, planet-wide wave of silence due to COVID-19, cost of preventing next pandemic is just 2% of what we spend for COVID-19, narcissists are less likely to wear masks and more likely to hoard groceries, extreme decline in world seafood resources, magnetic perception in hunting dogs and circadian rhythms in deep sea mussels, plus observances and opportunities for students and researchers. So stay tuned. Let us jump to the first story of the week, the study entitled Safety and Immunogenicity of Chadox-1 NCOV-19 Vaccine Against SARS-CoV-2, a preliminary report of Phase 1-2 Single Blind Randomized Controlled Trial, has been published in the journal The Lancet uh, by a team from Oxford University in UK. It's a randomized controlled trial, the gold standard in, uh, you know, the clinical medicine. And uh, the, they included the cohorts 1077. So this study is basically, it has been widely reported around the media sources in the world, including here in India, that uh, it's a good news for the vaccine development. You know, it has entered into the third stage of the clinical, uh, uh, you know, human trials. So the vaccine is called Chadox-1. So we have reported that in the curiosity, you know, the, the very beginning itself when the, that vaccine uh, has been the forerunner of the COVID-19 vaccine development. So Chadox-1 uh, vaccine appears safe and triggers the immune response. That is what the new study, the RCT, has been said. So by the way, what is this Chadox? So AD stands for adenovirus. It's a vector uh, recombinant vaccine. You know, it's a genetically engineered vaccine. Uh, consisting of the live adenovirus expressing the spike protein you know remember the spike protein uh, you know that is basically the uh, on the co coronavirus that is actually the you know the, the spikes that that enables the virus to attack with uh, attached with the mucous membranes of our intestines as well as in our uh, alveoli in the lungs you know so this is basically that uh, it has got, exp you know, it has got genetically engineered such a way that it expresses spike pro protein on the adenovirus, which is harmless. You know, it's a live, it's like polio vaccine, it's a live vaccine attenuated, uh, the live vaccine expressing the adenovirus. So this has led them, the vaccine, once you put these vaccines in the uh, trials, the cohorts, uh, the people, whoever is taking the vaccine, makes the antibodies and the T cells that can fight the coronavirus. So that is a, uh, it's a very good development. So it's a combined phase one and phase two clinical trial. By the way, what is this phase one, two and three? So in very simple words, phase one uh, clinical trial, the human, all these are about the human trials, you know, phase one is the lowest step. It's all about the safety to make sure that the vaccine is safe. It won't actually cause coronavirus infection or you know, COVID-19. So it is safe, that is what. So once you complete the phase one trial, then phase two is all about efficacy and dosage. So is it really efficient? And what is the appropriate dose? And do you need a booster dose? All those things are in the phase two level. And finally, the phase three are large scale effectiveness. So it is not merely in the lab scale, but large scale, you know, the public trial, that is a phase three. That is what the Chadox, the Oxford vaccine has now recently entered from the last week. So once you have completed phase one and determined that the drug doesn't kill people, then you go to the phase two to make sure that the drug does what you want it to do. That is a phase two. Now, finally, phase three is a large scale trial. So it's a very good news. Now, coming to the second story of the week is, a, 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 you know, it's a paper, a rapid communication entitled a large COVID-19 outbreak in a high school 10 days after schools reopening in Israel, May 2020. So after the schools have reopened after the lockdown period, you know, so uh, the paper has been published in a journal called Euro Surveillance, it's Israel team. So after the reopening of the school, there had been a, a big outbreaks reported in different schools. So in this particular school, what has been connected is that a large COVID-19 outbreak in the high school 10 days after schools reopening in Israel found that the prevention involves studying in small groups and minimizing the student mixing 
you know and teachers should wear the face mask because teachers are the one who speaks a lot and of course students too uh, everyone should wear the face mask these days so you know to prevent the COVID-19 infection and also for preventing the uh, community transmission of the COVID-19 so testing of the complete school the Israeli people they did a great job they tested the whole school and uh, school community revealed that 153 students with the attack rate of 13.2 percentage and 25 staff members with attack rate st uh, slightly higher at 16.6 percentage were COVID-19 positive so it's a big uh, deal about reopening you know in our country also we are now entering the phase three of the uh, you know we are actually coming back right lockdown is already over so we are now coming back to normal so the phase three is about to start from august 1st onwards so what are the options left to us when we reopen our schools and universities what precautions to be taken so the Israeli study says that learning from home may reduce the need for the class attendance. So online uh, teaching and online learning is way to go. Uh, it might continue for the next one year. Who knows? And if the physical learning is needed, of course, for the school education, physical is the best option. For online learning might be appropriate for the universities and higher education. But for school, you know, physical learning... Uh, there is no compromise so in that case then outdoor classes should be considered because uh, as per I have covered that in my youtube channel as well there is a huge confusion that whether the COVID-19 is an airborne disease or not so let us stick with the worst case scenario that the COVID-19 is uh, indeed a, a airborne disease so in that case avoiding any closed uh, you know areas for example supermarkets with air conditioner is uh, what is what the epidemiologist is uh, what is epidemiologists is suggesting and infectious disease experts are suggesting so in that case uh, you know the classes uh, it's always better to hold these classes in the outdoors in the nature you know and plus well uh, the study didn't say but this is a common sense I have been advocating for uh, last few weeks that you have to speak in a low voice whispering is always better because the speech uh, there are studies of course that says that the amplitude amplitude means intensity or loudness of your speech is correlated with the droplets you know so if you speak in a very low voice it's, it's always better to prevent the transmission of the COVID-19 and perhaps you can use a loudspeaker in your class so if you speak or whisper in the classroom uh, students might not hear it right so especially in the outdoor setting so it's better to use a loudspeaker our third story of the week is a paper published in Science, the American Journal. Uh, it's a brief report. The title of the report is Global Quieting of High Frequency Seismic Noise Due to COVID-19 Pandemic Lockdown Measures. So uh, it's led by an international team from different continents, all continents, uh, you know, except Antarctica. So what the paper says is that wave of silence spread around the world during coronavirus pandemic as much as 50 percentage drop in the high frequency noise. So we all know that uh, positive impacts of the COVID-19 infection, uh, pollution levels are decreasing, climate change is, uh, uh, there is a very slight, uh, you know, uh, reversal trend in climate change but of course that uh, you know that might not last for a long time because we are now uh, you know going back to the early stage right we are traveling uh, uh, many inter intercontinental flights have opened up but still uh, there are uh, you know uh, several good news about COVID-19 uh, pandemic so one new interesting uh, finding that this study reports is about the wave of silence especially for seismologists uh, and geologists be happy about so records from the seismic stations all around the planet show that the high frequency noise caused by industrial plants traffic and other activities fell as much as 50 percentage so anthropogenic high frequency noise especially vibrations that interferes with the seismological readings have fell down more than 50 percentage so without the human hum to over overhem them seismologists can now more easily spot the micro earthquakes driven by incremental slippage along geological faults once they have recorded a quake from a particular fault they can use the fingerprint of the trimmer to look back over archived records to see if the fault has slipped before the same goes for monitoring volcanoes near urban centers so uh, volcanic eruption and earthquake predictions models are becoming more and more smarter because of this wave of silence friends 
and this is why uh, you know seismologists uh, uh, always go to they, they are uh, you know part of the Antarctic missions uh, of the different countries of the world because Antarctica is like a uh, the uh, you know it's like a giant voice cancelling machine uh, because it's uh, pin drop silence in Antarctica was part of the Antarctic mission of India so there is a uh, you know there is an installation called Spresso S P R E S S O by American Seismological Society. So Spresso is also uh, you know it, their uh, sensitivity is extremely high because of the low noise. So good news now is that because of the COVID nineteen even the normal seismologic stations uh, you know the noise background noise is significantly lower. So we can we are, we uh, this enables the seismologist to record even a micro earthquakes and micro tremor that's a good news a quote from the paper in cities with geological hazards such as earthquakes volcanoes and landslide we want to monitor and maybe get a warning of what's going on but with the human noise increasing it will become increasingly hard to see those small signals uh, Hicks said uh, so we are hoping this will spawn a whole new set of studies in this new field of human noise so that's an exciting piece of news Coming to the next story again concerned with the COVID-19, ecology and economics of pandemic prevention that's a policy forum paper published in last week in the American Journal Science. So it's by Princeton University in the US team and it's experts from environment, medicine, economics and conservation allow this kind of studies, you know, inter or transdisciplinary studies combining science and humanity and economics experts all together. So, uh, the, what the paper says is that the cost of preventing next pandemic equal to just two percentage of the COVID-19 economic damage. So what COVID-19 has already been done, you just need two percentage to prevent the next global pandemic. Uh, that's a revelation, friends. Two new virus a year had spilled from the wildlife host into humans over the last century. That is what the researchers say. Two spillover, spillover by the way, is that wildlife to the human you know the coronavirus also the, the existing uh, pieces of evidence clearly say that it has spread to human from the wildlife because of the wildlife trade and deforestation happens in China you know so the what researchers are saying is that on average you are going to have two spillovers per year that has been happening in our world over the last many years or rather a century so with the growing destruction of the nature meaning that the risk today is higher than ever you know so how can we prevent the next COVID-19 or next pandemic so there was a clear link between deforestation and the virus emergence they said with forest bats are likely to be the reservoirs of Ebola, SARS, COVID-19 viruses and tropical forest edges as a major launch pad of the new virus infecting the humans so we really have to save our wildlife and save our forest friends so to save the forest, uh, you know, the deforestation, we have to stop and wildlife trade, especially wildlife meat, you know, wild meat or bush meat trade and also the alternative medicine. Uh, not many people are talking about the, the importance of the alternative medicine in the wildlife trade. So they, they play a significant role, uh, you know, for example, the Chinese traditional medicine or any kind of herbalism even. Uh, herbal medicine have uh, inordinate fancy uh, with rare species so you say that the himalayan species is extremely rare it's extremely potent that is not the case rarity has nothing to do with the you know the the efficacy of a, a drug you know i have covered this topic uh, a large number of times in my youtube channel please have a look at linked videos below so the paper argues that what we have already spent for COVID-19 is this pink square. You see, it's 11.5 trillion US dollar. It's a humongous amount that has already been spent. That includes the total coronavirus damage, including the lost GDP plus the mortality cost. Now, to prevent the next COVID-19, all you need is just this small uh, rectangle, you know, the red rectangle. That is just two percentage of what has been already spent. So the this small rectangle is 26.6 billion US dollar. You know, of course, a significant amount, but it's just two percentage of this big one. So this rectangle, if you enlarge it, the majority of this will lead to ending the wild meat trade in China, because a lot of this kind of uh, spillover events have happened in China. So to end it, 
it's a huge industry friends 19.4 billion US dollar industry and another major chunk will go for reducing the tropical deforestation by 40 percentage in most critical regions you know and another main chunk will go to reducing the disease spillover via livestock you know and another chunk is for monitoring the wildlife trade and the finally reducing the disease spillovers from the wildlife 230 million so all over this one is just two percentage of what we have spent already that is a revelation friends now fifth story of the week is again about the COVID-19 and the link with personality so it's basically a mix of two papers the first paper is published in the journal personality and individual differences uh, in fact both the papers have been published in the same journal the first paper the title is who complies with the restrictions to reduce the spread of COVID-19 personality and perceptions of the COVID-19 situation by an Italian team and the second paper same journal uh, the title is adaptive and maladaptive behavior during COVID-19 pandemic roles of dog triad traits collective narcissism and health beliefs so this dog triad trait I have covered that in earlier episode of curiosity you can ch check it out this paper is by the Polish team while the earlier paper is by an Italian team so the new researchers found that the people with dog personality characteristics such as a psychopathy and narcissism are less likely to comply with efforts to impede the spread of the, the novel coronavirus the SARS-CoV-2 so you see that uh, the the dark triad is basically Mischiavellianism and uh, narcissism and psychopathy you know Mischiavellianism is all about um, interpersonal manipulation so manipulative personality trait while uh, psychopath is a, it's a broad term that is basically it's a people who are are showing the antisocial behavior you know and uh, of course narcissism means uh, it's extreme self-love you know and self-importance and other people's are not that important their words doesn't matter that is what this uh, narcissist are all about right so these people with these personality traits are more likely to stockpile the goods such as food and toilet paper that is exactly what the term hoarding means you know stockpiling so the dark triad of narcissism psychopathy and mischievalianism are associated with ignoring the preventive COVID-19 measures including social distancing and uh, wearing the mask a quote from the paper the coronavirus outbreak is a medical as well as social problem as it forces us to adopt specific behaviors to control the situation like physical distancing and wearing mask so you know so uh, people who are getting infection maybe they are also you know so are uh, prone for this kind of uh, social problems as well as psychological problems so that reveals some inherent tendencies of human uh, you know psychology that which personality traits are more uh, high risk group for getting the COVID-19 disease and the sixth journal is again a very interesting uh, journal it's also connected to the earlier fifth story uh, the interesting uh, news uh, this piece of news is all about the p political ideology and COVID-19 infection so the title is political ideology predicts the perceptions of the threat of COVID-19 and susceptibility to fake news about it so the paper has been published in the journal social and psychological personality uh, science by the sage journals uh, by a US team so the paper is about the political ideology which is shaping the individual responses to the pandemic that is what the online American study finds so conservatives who are staunch supporters of the President Trump were less knowledgeable about the virus less able to discern real from the fake news and in turn so COVID-19 as less of the threat uh, by the way it's an American study but the trend is same everywhere the extreme right-wing conservative uh, people are more likely to believe in fake news repeated studies have said that and also they distrust the science you know the extreme right-wing uh, people this is the same case in Brazil and elsewhere as well uh, a quote from the paper conservatism was associated with perceiving less personal vulnerability to the virus and the virus severity as lower and stronger endorsement for the beliefs that the media had exaggerated that the virus impact you know and that the spread of the virus was a conspiracy the Chinese conspiracy so it's a fake news but people who are extreme conservative extreme religious uh, people are more likely to believe in these conspiracy theories uh, you know the right-wing uh, people all around the world Trump supporters beat or the supporters of the Brazilian prime minister 
and uh, elsewhere in the world as well. So this is very interesting. There is a natural selection happening. So you know, by the end of this COVID-19 era, I um, have no idea how long will it last, but people who are suffering the COVID-19 uh, are basically um, most likely to be those from conservative and extreme religious background. That is what last curiosity episode, the episode number eight, also revealed a British, uh, you know, census survey that infection rates are much higher uh, for religious people rather than, uh, you know, atheists or non-believers. Uh, the COVID-19 infection is very less. So it might act as a natural selection, you know. By the end of many years, uh, you might see that uh, people who are extreme right wing or extreme conservative, uh, you know, extreme believers, they might actually die because of COVID-19 because they they mistrust or they distrust the science. They don't follow uh, the mask wearing or social distancing, you know. So that is actually an eye opener. Let it be an eye opener. If you believe in God, if you are a religious, you know, trust in science, friends. This time is no joke. The COVID-19 is no joke. Take the seriousness and wear a mask. Let us fight against the COVID-19 community transmission. The world is one, friends. Seventh story of the week is, uh, you know, uh, it is basically a very interesting study published in the journal, journal of Management, a very famous journal uh, by SMA Group. The title is, When and Why Narcissists Exhibit Greater Hindsight Bias and Less Perceived Learning. You know, it's about, it's a psychology study. Uh, it's about uh, hindsight bias and less perceived learning. Uh, the study is by a US team uh, with the 727 participants. By the way, the narcissism I just explained in my earlier studies also is typically defined as the belief in one superiority and entitlement uh, with narcissists believing that they are better and more deserving than the others while hindsight bias is a cognitive bias that refers to the tendency to exaggerate in hindsight that one actually knew in foresight. That means uh, I already knew what is coming. That is called the hindsight. Hindsight bias. By the way, the paper is all about learning from mistake. So, you know, it's a science. If you ask me what a science is all about, I will simply say learning from the failures. You know, so it is at a personal level also. We have to learn from the, the failures or mistakes that we did it earlier, right? But if you're a narcissist, then uh, tendency is high for the narcissist that they will not learn anything. That is what this study says. You know, it's a very interesting study. So narcissists don't learn from their mistake because they don't think that they made any mistake. <laughs> you know, interesting. So when most people find that their actions have resulted in an undesirable outcome, they tend to rethink about their decision and ask, uh, what should I have done differently to avoid this outcome? So that is what they, they will think to improve, you know, the feedback loop. That is what the management is all about, isn't it? So the, the improving, improving in any management system, you need feedback. You know, if, if, would you want to be a better teacher? Get feedback from the student and improve it. That is what my own policy as a teacher in the university too. You know, the feedback loops are really important. Learning from failures are really, really important. But when narcissists face the same situation, however, the refrain is that, no one could have seen this coming. They justified themselves, you know. So that's really, really interesting. So in refusing to acknowledge that they have made a mistake, narcissists fail to learn from those mistakes. You know, they don't learn from the mistake. Well, all of us engage in some level of self-protective thinking. So we tend to attribute the success to our own efforts, but blame our failures on outside forces, while often blaming other people's failure, you know, on our own deficiency so we all engage in that thing but the narcissists do this way more because they think that they are better than others they don't take advice from other people they don't trust others opinion you can flat out and ask what should you have done differently and uh, it might be nothing it turned out it was good that is what a narcissist will say by the way i listened to a, a, a podcast yesterday uh, it's Freakonomics Radio, one of my favorite podcast friends. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do subscribe to Freakonomics. It's an economic-based theme, but they cover science and, uh, uh, you know, life hack and lifestyle choices, everything. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's an intermix. It's a fantastic podcast. So Freakonomics' last episode is about the Maria, uh, you know, Maria Konowski, uh, the Harvard PhD and um, a famous scholar uh, on, uh, you know, on... Uh, a probability probability reasoning and she has done a fantastic job on poker 
you know and she's a, of course a very famous player poker player of the world she has earned a lot of money playing poker so it's, it's very interesting uh, you know such a scholar uh, on probabilistic reasoning uh, going to the poker play it has really uh, amused me and what maria konikova in her interview with freakonomics uh, what she was saying is about uh, a locus of control we have two locus of control internal locus of control and external locus of control you know internal means that we internalize everything so this is as per the julian rotter's uh, concept the famous psychologist you know the rotter's uh, concept that two locus internalizing and externalizing so stoicism is all about internalizing so you know we, we should really differentiate between the two uh, kinds of control locus of control you know uh, sto that is in stoic philosophy they call it as stoic dichotomy of control you know something you can control something you cannot control so there is no point in vexing over things that you cannot control you know same thing so this internal locus of control and external locus of control so uh, you know the this study published in uh, the management journal of management that says that uh, narcissist they attribute everything to the external when they fail they don't learn from mistake <laughs> very interesting eye opening study isn't it our next story of the week the eighth story is about fish fish population you might know that it's under tremendous decline all around the world So the title of the study is that fishery biomass trends of exploited fish populations in marine ecoregions, climatic zones, and ocean basins. Uh, the paper has been published in the journal Estuarine and Coastal Shelf Science by Canadian, German, and Australian team. The highlights are first global long-term fishery biomass trends evaluation of of 1,300 exploited marine populations. and the study found decline in average fishery biomass observed across the oceans and climatic zones planet wide and systematic widespread overfishing of the world's coastal and continental shelf water so overfishing is one of the major reason for this decline as well as the climate change that is what the study says so world seafood species is in decline 82 percentage were below the levels uh you know that can produce maximum sustainability so sustainable fishing means leaving the juveniles behind for them to become old and sustain self sustaining uh, population right and if you cross that uh, uh the threshold limit then what is going to happen is that the population starts shrinking that is what is happening at 82 percentage of the population included in this study so 87 populations were in very bad category with biomass levels at less than 20 percentage of what need to maximize the sustainable fishery catches you know part of the issue is the way commercial fishermen troll so the trolling boat trawlers so you know the trawler boats are really really dangerous friends so the trolling is all about dragging huge nets along the bottom of the ocean you know and it's really destructive in the coastal zone the bottom is not that deep it's in few hundred meters so it can easily be done so it's really destructive the troll trolling fishing is destructive and the greatest declines in stocks were found in southern temperate and polar indian ocean and southern polar atlantic ocean where population shrunk by well over 50 percentage since 1950s you know so these two regions the indian ocean southern and uh, south atlantic ocean are really interesting so maybe there is a connection with uh, uh you know the global oceanic circulations you know southern oscillations el nino and la nina phenomenon as well because uh, what i find is that these two regions are not extremely overfishing right overfishing happens elsewhere but the effects are foul, you know felt in down south which is sparsely populated especially in southern uh in the ocean and polar in the ocean not many people go to there except antarctic explorers but still uh you know the the fish populations are in tremendous decline so it's well another good reason to avoid shrimp specifically divined uh you know shrimp that means the shrimp that uh, you know you actually clean up remove the bones so is that the most of the work is done by slave labor so it's just like the diamond trade the diamond is also by the slave traders and slave laborers are doing all this uh, you know work is the same thing with the shrimp pass well friends so another good reason to avoid it for sustainable fisheries so our ninth story of the week is about the dogs you know so it's a story published in a famous journal e life the the title of the story is a magnetic alignment enhances homing efficiency in hunting dogs 
you know so it's by the Czech team from uh, Czech Republic so it included 223 trips of the hunting dogs around 27 dogs so dogs may use Earth's magnetic field to take the shortcuts that is really interesting story over 200 hunting dogs were set loose and tracked over the GPS and out of 223 trips 170 trips dogs stopped before returning and ran 20 meter along north south axis of the planet you know our earth's north south axis that is basically the same axis of a compass you know so the dog stops and they ran along this axis very interesting you know no one knows that prior to this study so when they did this the dogs tend to get back to the owner via a more direct route than when they did not so they did this means running along the axis so when the dogs ran along the axis for around 20 meters the uh, chances are high that they could able to return back to the uh, owner's arm you know so it's part of our evolutionary history magnetoreception may be the primal sense so that, that is what the famous caught by uh, Jock Kishwink, uh, quite a famous chap. He is a geophysicist at the Caltech in Pasadena. So he is the one who championed uh, many study. Uh, you know, he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars investigating on magnetoreception human beings. Uh, his study has been widely circulated in Scientific American and New Scientist. Uh, you know say what lots of research he did it with something called Faraday cage you know he especially built a special cage with uh, layers of aluminium such that uh, you know you won't be exposed to external magnetic field including the earth's magnetic field and he got some merit, merit coils to create a high power magnetic field and then you know the researchers analyzed human beings the subjects the uh, how the brain functions by EEG machine and also by fMRI unfortunately uh, despite spending humongous amount the Caltech researchers couldn't find any promising research uh, uh, yet but still uh, probably I'm also hopeful that you know the, they could able to find something may not be in the brain but somewhere else um, you know there had been some reports that says that our own you know the, the facial bonds do contain the iron uh, ore the something called uh, magnetite by the way many uh, you know the birds as well as the fish can sense the magnetism right so there are two models the first model is something called magnetite model in which the fish basically fish can smell the magnetism right that actually happens in the olfactory bulb so what is really happening is that magnetite is an iron ore so as you know the iron is sensitive to the magnetism right so uh, magnetite is present in the magnetoreceptor cell underneath the cilia in the olfactory hub of the, the, the uh, fish. So what is happening is that inside cytoplasm this uh, magnet, you know, magnetite is there and when they move it opens up the iron channel that actually gives the potential difference so that actually causes the uh, neurons to fire so that the fish can sense uh, where exactly is the magnetic location so that's really really interesting. In the case of uh, birds, it is something else. They actually, uh, while the fish can smell the magnetic field, birds can see, you know, the, the, it's actually inside the retina. If you closely observe the eye of the birds, you can see that the retina contains this very special kind of cone cell. It's a double cone cell, not, uh, I mean, of course, it has got rod as well, rod and cone. So it's this double cone cell, uh, this contains something called cryptochrome. So this is the cryptochromes, you know, the electron revolution is, uh, you know, where this uh, electrons are evolving, uh, plus or minus. So that actually changes the radical pairs forming. So it's a little bit tricky to understand, but still uh, that is exactly where uh, the birds are actually sensing, you know, the magnetic field. Very interesting study, isn't it? So this how this is not the new, we already know, the science already knows that what, how the birds can sense it. By the way, you might know that uh, the bird which can uh, migrate the longest in the world is Arctic Tern, friends. And do you know how, how big is Arctic Tern? It's mere 113 grams. You know, it's such a small bird. I have seen Arctic Tern when I was in Antarctica. And it's amazing. The bird is really amazing. Arctic Tern goes from Greenland all the way to Antarctica every year in a zigzag motion covering almost 71,000 kilometers. You know, the return journey is 71,000 kilometers. 
and they live long arctic turn the average life expectancy is around 30 years so in this time the 30 years period uh, you know how much kilometers they can travel in their life lifespan it's almost 2.4 million kilometers friends 2.4 million kilometer means three times you can go to the moon and come back the lunar uh, trips you know <laughs> amazing nature is amazing friends and of course the turn have this magnetoception ability that enables them to travel from north pole to the south pole and back you know amazing and by the way uh, you know there's another uh, interesting uh, paper published in pinas uh, last week and the paper is entitled elevated paleomagnetic dispersion at saint helena suggests long lived anomalous behavior in south atlantic very interesting study so the, the study uh, in a very common language the study says that earth you know the earth has got the uh, north and south pole right the geomagnetic uh, poles so these poles basically swap north pole becomes south pole south pole becomes north pole so this swapping or you know it happens uh, every uh, almost um, uh, you know a few thousands of uh, years so next swap of these two poles are expected to be sooner that is what the, st the study says they analyze something called saint helena it's basically in south atlantic uh, you know atlantic mid ridge so this particular study found an elevated paleomagnetic dispersion at an anomaly uh, anomalic region in south atlantic so the study confirms that this swap of this geomagnetic pole is imminent and how imminent how many years will it take or how many hundred or even thousands of years we have no clue let us wait and watch and of course the ramifications is going to be tremendous it's going to impart uh, all of our uh, uh, you know communication networks plus you know the animal behavior as well we have seen that fish and birds and even dogs you know so let us wait and watch what is going to happen our 10th story of the week is an exciting story published in nature communications the title of this article is biological rhythms in the deep sea hydrothermal muscle bathymodiolus azoricus it's a muscle in a deep sea hydrothermal vent by a french team from ifremer ifremer is a very famous french national institute of oceanography and marine exploration you know so the diving submarine finds that the deep sea organisms living in the total darkness still follow the internal clocks set by the sun and tides exciting piece of information that the study revealed so observations of the deep sea mussels both at depth and in the lab confirm regular rhythmic patterns in their behavior and their gene expression for instance tracking the roughly 12 hour cycles of the tides so the, this kind of field is what you call chronobiology the discipline that deals with the rhythms of the li living organisms you know so the study collected from the hydrothermal vents 1700 deep using a remotely operated vehicle rov remotely operated it's like a robot that can deep dive as you know if you go deeper it becomes pitch dark uh, so the limit usual limit is around 200 300 meters and below that it's going to be very dark but about 1000 meters is going to be pitch dark so it is really dark and more than that the hydrostatic pressure is also tremendous you know so the robotic arm can do a lot of experiment that is what i was more interested to see how they did it the methodology section of the paper friends is amazing they did some cutting edge technology you know to collect the muscles the robotic arms even did the in situ fixing of this muscle for transcriptomic study you know the mrna expression studies so well very little is not about the deep sea that encompass 93 percentage of the biosphere in the volume so so 93 percentage of the earth's biosphere is deep sea friends and we have no clue what you know what is living in this uh, deep seas so a popular aphorism goes like this we know more about moon than our own oceans that's right you know we are spending a lot of money on lunar explorations but uh, you know equipments that can do this deep sea diving is extremely low only very few uh, countries in the world for example uh, France or US you know or Japan has got the deep diving 
uh, submarines. Unfortunately, majority of the other countries, even though they are really good in space exploration, for example, here in India, we are pretty good in uh, space exploration. But unfortunately, we don't have any diving submarine, you know, the research submarines uh, that enables us to study uh, what is living in our ocean, in the deep uh, sea. So this is a submarine which they use. It's basically a remotely operated vehicle ROV. Uh, it is, the name is called Victor 6000 uh, by the Ephremer. It's fantastic and I'm really impressed with that. This is the image that this, uh, you know, Ephremer's uh, Victor 6000 has taken. This is Bathymodiolus azoricus. It's a, a deep sea living hydrothermal uh, vent living uh, muscle, you know, and they did the transcriptome assessment of this. Coming to the news from the last week, starting from the COVID-19 treatment and vaccine update. Coming to the treatment, there is no update. It's the same thing from the last week. We have three candidates at the phase three clinical trials. Uh, Remdesivir, Gymsilumab, and two antibody cocktail from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. And we have one candidate at phase two clinical trials. That is multi-stem. It's a stem cell based uh, approach by Ethersis. Coming to vaccine, I've already covered the first story of this week is this uh, exciting piece of information uh, from the University of Oxford or AstraZeneca, the, the Swedish uh, pharmaceutical giant. We have one candidate at the phase three clinical trial. So phase three is a final clinical trial, friends. It's a large scale trial of the vaccine. Amazing piece of information, you know. So we also have three candidates at the phase two clinical trial. Earlier last week it was only two, but now we have got three candidates, Moderna Therapeutics, Sinovac and CanSino Biologic. CanSino has entered the, the, the phase two clinical trial phase as well. Coming to the other news, this is a circular by, uh, you know, this uh, uh, AIMS, Director General of the Health Services of the Ministry of uh, health and family welfare they released this uh, interesting circular that prevents the use of the mask with valve so if you ever seen people wearing mask with valve this becomes illegal in india friends uh, the, the government clearly prohibits the use of it, it you know the, this is basically the it, it, it's a warning against the use of n95 mask with a valve respirator or any kind of mask with valve i've covered this in uh, my channel much earlier than this news so it is basically an impact of the videos that we uh, relay in our channel so in my channel this is a video that i, I put please don't wear mask with the wars many people think that this plastic round button is uh, nothing but a filter it is not a filter it's a wall like the hot wall you know that allows our exhaled air unfiltered unhindered so if you are a covid 19 positive you are actually letting all the virus go out so basically the mask that we are wearing is not for us it's for others it's part of the etiquette you see so that is why wearing mask with war will not prevent the community transmission of uh, the covid 19. so this uh, uh, video you can check in my uh, youtube channel as well i released this in may 12 on 2020 <clears throat> almost 70 days before the release of the government so i'm really really glad about this policy impact of my uh, uh, the video the video has been watched well over 8000 people till date you know tremendous impact friends yet another exciting story from the last week is this albino yellow turtle from balasor a uh, cost of odisha it's very interesting uh, rare occurrence so probably it's not a species it's just an albino of an existing species but pretty cute you know and this has been earlier reported in uh, uh, synth in uh, pakistan you know so this is really interesting we have yet another yellow animal in the last week this is a yellow frog uh, you know it's called bullfrog of course it's not new it's a uh, it's a well known and i'm really impressed that the hindu ran a, a very interesting coverage of this uh, indian bullfrog uh, it's the breeding season just because of the breeding season they ran a very interesting exciting story uh, from the Sanjeevan area in the Delhi so this frog uh, is very interesting because it's the biggest frog in Indian subcontinent and uh, uh, more than uh, you know more than that only males are yellow you know it's basically a sexual display to attract the females you know and it's a breeding season yet another uh, yellow story from the last week is uh, uh, the, the sun we have the closest ever sun pictures and this has been taken by the solar orbiter at the distance of 77 million kilometer friends 77 million is like half the distance from earth 
to sun so it's immensely close uh, by the way we have got uh, two uh, you know uh, solar props currently one is solar orbiter that has taken this these all these images the second one is parker probe you know and we have two such things so these are basically the uh, anomalies in the surface of the sun uh, you know whirlpools like uh, coronal mass ejections by the way uh, the sun is in the lowest stage of 11 year old solar circle you know we, the solar activity is really really low right now so it will tremendously increase as the years passes by yet another story is uh, uh, rather a depressing story is from assam as you know that it's assam and entire northeast in uh, are facing a lot of crisis with the current flood you know lots of flood is happening and the flood is also causing havoc in the wildlife you know so surging brahmaputra takes heavy toll on the state wildlife especially on the rhino population in kaziranga national park you know so that is a, a not that a, a good piece of story coming to observance from the next week we have july 28 is the world hepatitis day the day is commemorated to uh, you know underline the the importance of preventing the hepatitis b infection as well as c and a hepatitis b is an infectious disease trends and it is transmitted by uh, sexual intercourse as well as sharing the needles you know for, for the drug addicts so if you practice safe sex and uh, you know uh, uh, stop uh, drug abuse for example uh, you can check the spread of the hepatitis b and more than that if you're a high risk person belongs to any of this uh, high risk group identified by world health organization you know go and grab a shot of the hepatitis b vaccines we have very efficient vaccine against hepatitis b available in the market even if you are not a high risk group i strongly recommend you to get get a shot of this hepatitis b vaccine uh, the cost is around 1000 rupees less than 1000 rupees you know so indigenous vaccine developed by our vaccine institute is just 40 or 50 rupees you know you can get it yes i have taken hepatitis b vaccine so july 30 is international day of friendship that is by the un observation for the friendship so friendship is not just merely social your own you know localized social circle but the un friendship day is for intercontinental friends have you ever made any friends across the continents you know for example do you have any friend from south america or from africa yes i do you know and i keep on uh, communicating with them so this intercultural and intercontinental friendship are really binding forces for the world friends so world is one we have only one planet and you know don't think too constrained with the national boundaries we should have international friends too that is what the the real essence of the international day of friendship now coming to july 30th is a world day against trafficking in persons so the day for human trafficking friends human trafficking especially for sexual abuse of the minor is really really on increase you know and the trafficking is not merely limited to the sexual trafficking but also for labor child labor trafficking the the children across the continent for human labor so all these thing you know this is a, an exciting day to spread awareness about it so this is exactly what this blue heart campaign is all about blue as in heart is actually uh, in sorrow the blue color is basically the, the color of uh, sadness right many of the fellow citizens of the world have blue heart friends they're tremendously under extreme agony of the trafficking human trafficking we have to help them to check the spread of this human trafficking that is what july 30 is all about coming to astronomy related observances in case you missed the last week's uh, new wise comet you know of course we have fantastic pictures for example this is a very interesting picture uh, from italy and uh, we do have a meteor shower Poseidon's meteor shower is uh, already on the way and Venus becomes morning star the whole of July uh, it is a morning star in the you know just before the uh, down you can see that uh, the, the Venus very clearly and Arctus and Virgo the constellations you can really see throughout the July and by the way I discovered two very interesting exciting app that actually uses your uh, uh, magnetic sensor of the phone and these are android app sky view and sky safari fantastic app and it's much much better than google's uh, default sky map app i've been using sky map for many uh, years for uh, you know for sky watching but sky view and sky safari are really really nice they even can spot you know this uh, uh, comets and asteroids fantastic 
coming to opportunities we have got um, uh, many new opportunities this week cdfd's research scholar positions deadline is 9th august grants officer position at iac bangalore 30th july is a deadline scientific officer at ncbs bangalore if you are less than 28 years 31st july is a deadline and of course other opportunities we have already covered in the last week including dbt welcome trust india alliance early career 11th august is a deadline senior and intermediate of the same scheme 30th july is a deadline max japanese government undergraduate scholarship 17th august is a deadline s ramachandran national bioscience award by dbt that is 2 lakh rupees cash prize 15th august is a deadline and Mary curie actions uh, fellowship for the phd in europe 9th september is a deadline I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Curiosity. Before leaving friends, I have this request for you. Please, please wear mask and please maintain physical distancing because COVID-19 cases are on surge throughout our India, you know, and we really have to do extreme precautions for that. Please wear the mask as well as please, uh, you know, observe the physical distancing. See you again next week for our 10th episode of Curiosity. Goodbye.